So we have Sagwoon here, one of our one of our one of our lovely speakers. And he is an en en research engineer with face Facebook AI re research. He's previously worked as an ML developer, the data science team in Adobe Systems. His st stack primarily comprises of Python and related MS visualization do do kits, toolkits. And he loves to play with new technology and look forward to meeting people at PyData. And uh, if you'd like to kick off your talk. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, I hope the screen is visible, the slides are visible. I cannot see this, uh, I cannot see the chat. So I request you to, uh, you know, still keep posting the questions, but uh, I'll be answering the questions uh, after the end of the talk. So I'll, I'll make sure I leave about five minutes in the end for us to go over the questions. Uh, yeah, so so we are going to talk about profiling and tuning PyTorch models. Uh, brief intro, so I'm, I'm a research engineer at FAIR. I primarily work on lifelong learning and reinforcement learning. And I have been using and talking about PyTorch for about three years now. So hopefully there would be something useful for the audience in this talk. Um, just a high level introduction to PyTorch, which probably people don't need if they are already in this talk. PyTorch is this Python package which provides two high level features. It provides a tensor computation. Uh, you can think of tensor as uh, ND array that NumPy provides. It provides this ten tensor abstraction with a strong GPU acceleration support. So you can create tensors on the GPU. You can perform operations on these tensors on GPU. And the second thing it provides is this autograd system, which makes it very useful tool for implementing neural networks uh, or, or implementing um, complex machine learning architectures. A quick disclaimer, this slide is based on PyTorch 1.9.1. And I'm saying this because I think about four or five days back, PyTorch 1.10 came out. Uh, that has all the things that I'm gonna describe here. And it has certain extra things uh, specifically related to profiling. For example, it has support for Quora graphs. Uh, so those topics are not covered in this slide. This focuses on PyTorch as it was in 1.9.1. Okay, so with this, let's get started with PyTorch profiling. So what's the idea behind profiling? The idea is we have a PyTorch model and we want to profile it or we want to figure out where the, where the model is spending most of its time. And once we have figured out where the model is spending its time, we can look at different tips and tricks for, for optimizing the model. So, so the first step of when we want to accelerate or make our model go faster or train faster, the first thing is we have to identify the bottlenecks. And this is what PyTorch profiling would cover. Uh, so the good part is uh, when you're doing PyTorch profiling, you do not need a new library because PyTorch ships with a profiler within itself. So the library itself contains a pro, uh, profiler. And uh, when you are using this, uh, the profiler lives within the torch namespace. So you can just do a prompt torch import profiler and you have the profiler with you. Throughout the slide, there are these uh, links with, which are called as further reading. These are basically links to the documentation. So when you are looking at these slides later on, you have access to all the links at the, at the right place. And, and these slides would be available publicly. They are already available publicly. I'll, I'll share the link uh, in the Slack group. So the TLDR is the PyTorch profiler, PyTorch ships with a profiler, so you don't really need an external profiler, which is a good thing, one less thing to install. Uh, now, how do we use this profiler? So what I have here is in the first line, I'm creating a ResNet 18 model. Uh, it's okay if you don't know what a ResNet 18 model is, that's, that's not the relevant part. The important thing is I have a PyTorch model. And then I'm just creating a random input and I'm creating a random input because I don't really care about the model's predictions. I want to see where the model is spending most of its time. And once I have the model and the input, I create this context manager with, with the profiler. So remember the profiler is coming from Torch. So from Torch, we are importing the profiler. So I create a context manager where I say, hey, I want to profile the CPU activities. And I know I said that you can run tensors and everything on GPU and the profiler does support GPU, uh, does support tracking. Uh, memory and time and other things on the GPU. But for this example, we are tracking only the uh, activities on the CPU. So we are assuming everything is on the CPU for this example. Later, we'll see an example where things are on the Cura devices. So we are saying that we want to track the CPU activity, which basically means we want to track metrics related to CPU. And we also want to record the shapes. Record shapes basically means 
when the when we pass in an input and different layers apply different kind of transformations, we want to record the shape of those transformations. Uh, sometimes this can be useful for understanding uh, how the network is laid out. But generally, turning on record shapes equal to true, it's it's going to slow down your profiler because now the profiler has to track more things. So if you if you don't need to record the shapes, you can just uh, set it to false. So we create the prof we we use this context manager, and then there's this other function called as uh, record underscore function, the second context manager. This is really for our convenience. This is more that this is more from the perspective that once we would print out the logs. We want to have this thing called as model underscore inference, a, a high level node in the profiler, which would which would track everything happening within the model. But you can very well remove this, and the profiler would still be good to go. And the third line is where I'm calling the model with the input. So this is basically it's 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 passing the inputs to the model. And since we don't care about the predictions or the output, we are not tracking that. We we just call this. Now when we when we call this. Uh, so, so once you have called this, you uh, you have got this context ma uh, this uh, context manager uh, denoted as prop, and so from the prop you can print out the the profile, and you could say how many rows you want to see, and you can say what metric do you care about, or by what metric do you want to sort the things. So in this case, for example, we see that uh, the uh, the the different operators that we are looking in the first column, which is a name column. They are sorted by the CPU time total, which basically means how much time was spent uh, performing those operators. The first thing that you will see is model underscore inference, which is basically the name, uh, the record function name that I was using. Uh, if I had not put up the statement, the first line would not be there, uh, but it would not change anything else. You see a bunch of other uh, function call, uh, other operator calls like 18 con 2D, 18 convolution, 18 underscore convolution. These are basically uh, invoking the convolutional kernel, and uh, and we have a bunch of these convolutional calls and a bunch of batch norm calls because the ResNet 18 model has a bunch of convolutional and batch norm layers. So looking at it, it's it's clear that uh, most of the time is being I mean other than the model inference, which is something at a top level which we are tracking, most of the time in the setup is being spent into the convolutional layers. Uh, and along with this, the, the profiler also gives you the total CPU time or the total time it took for, um, for this operation to be done. Uh, now, let's say I, I uh, so yeah, so let's say I optimize something in the setup. And uh, obviously, we haven't talked about what we can optimize or what we cannot optimize. But for the moment, let's assume I tell you what you can optimize in the setup. Uh, so, so you you do that optimization, and the the goal here is that we do some optimization and we read on the profiler and we make sure whether things have improved or not. So, what I'm doing here is the first two lines are basically the same as before. I'm creating a ResNet 18 model. I'm setting up some inputs, and then I'm re uh, you know I'm I'm declaring the the decorator the profiler again. The optimization that I have done is this line where I'm saying I'm I'm putting an additional context manager where I'm saying. Uh, set it in the inference mode. It's it's perfectly okay if you don't. Uh, we we don't have to worry about what inference mode is doing. Uh, spoiler alert! Alert! What it does is it puts the model in the inference mode so that gradient tracking and other things are disabled. Uh, for for the uh, from the perspective of this slide, the important thing is that this is an optimization which is going to make the model faster. And we want to make sure that once we run this and we look at the logs with the other profiles with the profiler. We actually see a speed up, so so you don't need to worry about what this is doing. We are going to cover that in the next half of the talk. Okay, so I run the same thing again, and this time the total CPU time is uh, about 460 milliseconds. And just to go back a couple of slides, uh, the earlier time was 750 milliseconds. So again, the important thing is you you do an optimization change, or you or you do a change which you think would make the system go faster. So you do that change, and you can run the profiler once again. And you can see that whether this whether this thing has worked or not. And this is how you should generally be going about when you're profiling a model. So, so profile it before making a change, make the change, generally try to make only one change at a time. So make that change and run the profile again and make sure things are faster. Uh, yeah, and this is basically the previous stack. Uh, sorry, it's so I'm I'm basically showing you the new profile and the previous profile next to each other. The one on the top is the newer profile. The other on the bottom is the previous profile. So you can again see 
what are the places or what are the operations where we are spending most of the time um yeah and i think the again we are not going into the details of how no underscore inference mode works but in this case you would see for example that actually all the operations become somewhat cheaper so so the optimization that we did wasn't for one specific component it was more of a general optimization and and doing analysis like this is useful because sometimes you might do an optimization which makes one operator go faster but might make the other operator go slower and then being able to compare the profiles next to each other it it may it makes sure that you do not make one piece go faster at the cost of the other one now if we were to do the same thing with uh, when the model is running on gpu so we we have the same setup as before we we create this model and we create the inputs and the difference is that after creating the model we are sending it to the gpu device so dot coda is going to send it to a gpu the other difference is that now i am also tracking along with the cpu activities i am tracking the coda activities or the gpu activities as well so i have another uh, entry in the activities list uh, i again put this uh, model inference uh, top level name and i i run the model again i don't care about what the outputs are we just want to look at the profile and this time when i'm printing the profile i want to look at the cura time total so instead of looking at the cpu time total now we want to look at the cura time or the time that is spent on the gpu uh yeah so couple of things that stand out well first of all you have lot more columns than what you had earlier which is because earlier you just had cpu metrics but now you have cura metrics as well the second thing uh, sorry the second thing is now along with the cpu total time you have the cura total time as well so it's, it's telling you how much time was spent on the cpu device and how much time was spent on the gpu device and uh, in this case again i have sorted it by the cura time i could have sorted it by the other um, the, the cpu time as well you would see again the convolutional layers are something that comes out you would see a bunch of operations like sgm uh, which are which were probably not there earlier because these are the cura kernel calls and uh, you you still have the batch norm and other uh, operators that we saw earlier uh, this is the same uh, this is this is basically the previous table again with some of the columns removed out uh, so we see uh, yeah so these are the three new columns of interest that have been added which is the time the cura time the the percentage of the time spent and the actual cura total time that was spent and what we see is that in this in this network most of the time is spent in this function called codenn underscore convolution which is running the convolution on the on the gpu one thing to note is that the self cura time is not going to add up to one because uh, for example in this case atn codenn convolution is actually invoking some of these other expensive operations so if you if you if you hope that these times would turn up uh, would would add up to uh, would add up to 100 that's not the case that's because one operator is actually triggering the other operators and this this view is useful because when you see that the codenn convolution is an expensive operator you also understand that it's in, it's expensive because of the sgm uh, underscore sm operator so it gives you a more fine grained view of what exactly you should be focusing on or optimizing um okay now so far when we were logging these things we were only looking at the the time we were not looking at the memory but we can look at the memory as well and uh, in this example i'm showing how to track the memory on gpu but you can do the same thing for cpu as well it's just that you would not be sending your model and the input to the cura devices you just have to pass this additional flag called as profile memory so just like we send this record shapes equal to 2 we can send the profile memory equal to 2 as well just like record shape incurs an extra overhead for tracking the shapes profile memory is also going to incur an extra overhead uh but when you are profiling things that is where be okay but when you are when you are running these things for training or for inference you probably do not want to be running the profiler okay uh so now we have got some additional columns we have got a bunch of columns uh, related to cpu memory and a bunch of columns related to the cura memory as well uh yeah now this this view is useful but this view has its own limitations uh and there is a even more fine grain view that you can get which is called as the which is basically the trace view so you run your model you generate a trace and i'll show what a trace means or how a trace looks like but basically so you, you you can you can run your profiler as before and once you have finished the profiler you can ask for a trace 
via this export Chrome trace function. And you can, you can upload this trace on Chrome and visualize the trace. So that's what we are going to do. Uh, we wouldn't spend a lot of time into uh, understanding the entire trace, but we look at a few interesting things that come out. Uh, so once you have the trace, you just go to Chrome colon slash slash tracing and you can upload the trace. Uh, I'm going to come back to this image in a minute. Uh, this is basically the zoomed in view of the trace, but I want to show how the trace looks like when, when you are uploading it. So, uh, oops. Yeah. So I'm, uh, I'm on the, on the browser on the URL and I'm going to upload a trace. Uh, I have a few traces generated already. So, um, okay. This is a bit slow. <laughs> Let's probably go. Okay. No, this worked. Uh, Okay, so I have a trace which I'm gonna upload now. Um, it's gonna take a little while. Uh, let me just mark this. Uh, okay, let me let me close the other two tabs. These are basically the same trace open uh, as a backup, but since this trace thing is working, we probably don't need them. And let me move around this cursor a little bit. Yes, okay. So so there's a lot of things happening here. Let's let's minimize the information and look at some of the interesting pieces. So uh, yeah, for those of you who, have, who haven't used traces before, you can, uh, a, a trace is basically showing you when which operator is invoked. On, uh, on the top, you have the time. So it gives you at what time what operator was executed. And it also tells you what further operations were executed by an operator. So let's take an example. I'm just zooming in a bit. So you see, for example, uh, and probably this is not very clean to see, so we can go back to the slide. Uh, what you see is, uh, yeah. So for example, you see that there is this uh, 810 con 2D operation, which is invoking a 810 convolution operation, which is invoking a 810 underscore convolution operation. And so this gives you a view of which operation is invoking which other operation. And this view wasn't very clear from the tables that we had been looking at so far. Uh, so this is, this is one interesting aspect. Another interesting aspect is you see that there are some sort of white spaces between different operations. And this is basically the stall time. This is a time where we are not running an operation. And then that generally happens because we are waiting for the devices to synchronize, or there's an operation which we are waiting for, for which we are waiting that it would finish, or there's a, a kernel call that has been initiated but hasn't been started. So these, these white spaces that you see, these are places for improvement. A last thing I want to show before we move out is I have this flow event option, and I can turn on async. And you would see a lot of red lines coming in. Uh, let's just look at it because it's, it's, I think it gives out a strong uh, sort of um, a message which is not very obvious. So when you look at this, what these lines are showing is, since I've, uh, this, this trace was generated for a model that is running on GPU. So, so what happens is, for example, you register an operation, you launch the operation. So you can see, uh, let me turn on the flow for now. So you see there's an there's a operation called as CUDA launch kernel. And when we are doing uh, GPU operations, we often say that these things are asynchronous. And what it means is you launch it, and then you wait for, for the GPU to execute it. And this is what you see in the flow event. So if I now zoom out, uh, if I now zoom out, you see there is a, uh, there are all these lines which are starting from these kernel calls and which are, uh, oops, let me move it a little bit. Yeah, so there are all these lines which are starting from the kernel calls and which are, uh, oops, yeah, which are which are going into these uh, operations which are involved on the GPU. And you can see an operation, for example, that was registered here or invoked here actually gets executed way further in the future. Uh, and this is basically the asynchronous processing that we talk about, where we say that hey, we have we have launched an operation and the kernel is going to execute it, and then we'll get the device back. So the so the, these red lines, these flows that you see, this flow is basically denoting that behavior. Um, okay, um, and there's a bunch of other things that you can see. For example, you can see when an operation was queued, how many times it was queued, and so on. Uh, we we wouldn't go into all the all the aspects, but there are further links if you want to understand these pieces or look at these pieces. Okay, let's get oops, let's get back to to the talk. Um, we have about six minutes left. 
uh, okay. So yeah, so there are a bunch of other useful things. Uh, if you want to visualize these profiles as flame graphs, there's, there's code for that, the, uh, you, how to run Profiler when you're analyzing long running jobs, how to use Profiler with TensorBoard or VS Code, there are, there are useful links for all these things. At this point, let's turn gears and let's go into how can we tune PyTorch models. So what we have seen so far is once you have done something, how do you know whether this is good or bad? And now how do you do these good things to, to make your model go faster? Uh, some of these tips and tricks are going to be very general and sort of useful all the time. So you don't, uh, you don't have to, uh, you, it, it doesn't depend on the model architecture you are using. And some of these are going to be dependent on the model architecture. So the first example or the first tip is whenever you're do, using a data loader, use data, uh, enable multiprocessing. And the way you enable multiprocessing is when you're creating the data loader, you pass this flag called as num workers and you pass it to something positive. And num workers is going to allocate that many uh, worker processes for, for creating the data, a data loader batch. So you are not bottlenecked on the batch creation step. And if you don't do it, by default, it's a single process. So it's going to take longer for your batch to be ready. Again, at all, uh, with, with all the slides, we have the further reading references. So you can go into the documentation and you can see uh, what are the nitty gritty details. The second optimization is called as memory pinning. What memory pinning does is when you are moving data from CPU to GPU, especially when you are using data loaders, uh, every time you move the, the, the data from CPU to GPU, you're inferring a cost. Pin memory makes sure that this cost is amortized as reduced because uh, it, it basically pins some memory and it's faster to transfer data from CPU to GPU when the data resides in the pin memory. Uh, it's, it's again very easy to enable. All you have to do is when you're creating the data loader, just pass pin memory equal to two. Uh, the third example is the inference mode, which we saw earlier, and we saw we were getting a good amount of speed up with that. What inference mode does is, well, inference mode, uh, it, it gives you better performance, but the way it gives you better performance is that it disables view tracking and version counter. What it basically means is you should be using inference mode only when you know that the code that you're going to use would not be used with AutoGrad or you would not be computing gradients on that. And whenever you are using such a code, you can use the inference mode with that. Uh, oops. Another common sort of, uh, um, you know, generally applicable optimization is when you're using optimizer, uh, we generally do an optimizer.0 grad, but instead of doing an optimizer.0 grad, you can pass this extra argument called a set, called a set to none. And then the gradients would not be zero, the gradients would be set to none. And just for, for large enough models, this can be a performance benefit because you're not actually going to the parameters and explicitly setting them to zeros. It has some caveats, and I would recommend that you, you go through the documentation to understand whether those caveats would be a problem for you. Uh, another thing, another very sort of uh, useful thing to do is uh, enable the CoDN and an auto tuner. And for that, you just have to set this, uh, this, this argument uh, to be true when you start running your code. Uh, the downside of this is that it can make your code non-deterministic. I mean, that, that's, that's one caveat. All the optimizations that we are seeing, they have caveats. In some cases, you would care about those caveats. In some cases, you would not. Uh, it just, it's better to be aware that there are caveats and you know, instead of being surprised by, by the results. Uh, so the caveat of Cody and an auto tuner is that it can make your results non-deterministic. And this is generally specifically for the convolutional network. So if you're not using convnets, maybe this is not relevant for you. Uh, this is another easy way. Whenever you're doing multi-GPU processing, instead of, using instead of using data parallel, use distributed data parallel. In fact, I think at this point, data parallel has been deprecated. So it's, it's yeah, there's, there's no scenario, there's no use case where you should be using data parallel instead of distributed data parallel. Uh, another example is that you should be fusing pointwise operators, and it's a little tricky one, but the high level idea is when your stuff, when your, when your operators are on the GPU or sometimes even on CPU, and when you have operations like this, where you are saying X multiplied by half into some, 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 so that when you have a lot of these pointwise operations, PyTorch would be launching a separate kernel for all of them. And sometimes the overhead of launching these kernels could be too high. And so what you can do is you can fuse them into one single kernel call. And all you need to do for that is add this decorator at the rate torch.jit.script. And there are a bunch of other ways of doing it. This is probably one of the most convenient ones. Uh, TLDR, if you have a lot of pointwise operators, consider using JIT to fuse them into one single call. That would save you the kernel overhead. 
Building on the idea of using jitting, you can also use fused optimizers. This is a little bit more involved because uh, depending on your use case, you might have to build the optimizer from the source and not all the optimizers are supported at this point, uh, but it gives you the similar benefits as we saw in the previous slide. So you can use fused optimizers as well. Uh, this is another advanced optimization, but the idea is that when you have a very large model and you have a large batch space, you checkpoint the intermediate buffers, which basically means that instead of carrying around the entire computation graph, you checkpoint it on the disk so that you can you, you have more memory available on the system. And when you are doing a backward pass, uh, you, you load those checkpoints. So this gives you, this frees up some memory. So this, this enables you to use larger models, but this would slow down training. So it's an optimization on the memory side, but not an, or, or, or it's a, it takes a performance hit on the uh, time side. All right, Sharon. I'm gonna check it. Sort of check and see if anyone's got questions. Yeah, sorry about that. I didn't cut you off too soon. Uh, no, it's just two slides left, so we we are actually at good time at, at a good place. Oh, all right. Yeah, you, you go ahead if you want to. Uh, okay, I'll just quickly cover the two slides. Uh, you know, avoid the unnecessary CPU to GPU synchronization, and examples of these synchronizations are print statements things like dot item, dot CPU. Uh, very often we don't even realize that this is a synchronization step, but try to avoid it as long as you can. Uh, use mixed precision and AMP. This is also a bit advanced, but the high level idea is instead of tracking things in float 32, you start tracking weights and other things in FP16 and that frees up some memory. Uh, yeah, that's it. And at the end, there are some references uh, for, for you to give more sort of guidance and uh, more hints for optimizing the setup. Yeah, thank you for the talk. It's definitely interesting to see what's going on in like uh, optimization. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. You have a you have a wonderful day. You too. Bye bye.